Good morning. Good morning. When I was at Loyola, we had, they called it a President's Scholarship. Hello there. Good morning. First of all, on this glorious day, you could have all been out hiking. <laughs> Thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Josie Heath, and this panel is the best two parties that money can buy. This is Tuesday, April 11th, the second day of the Conference on World Affairs, and I'm delighted to welcome our panelists to Boulder and to the Conference on World Affairs, and especially to say thank you to so many of you who are really interested in this important topic. So um, yesterday I was in the back row, and I said that because this is kind of the same level, I know it's a little harder to hear back there. So I've asked our panelists to make their opening remarks here at the podium so that you might hear. So let me introduce them in the order in which they're going to be speaking. And the first is John Harrison Nichols. John is the associate editor of the Capital Times in Madison, Wisconsin. I might say, uh, wait, you can't hear. Yeah, I'm wondering, can people All right. Hear? All right. Producer, how are you doing? Can you hear me back there? Yeah. Leslie can't hear. I can. That, does that help? A little? Enough? All right. Advice? To, to, wait. We need seats. If you've got a good chance to meet a new friend, raise your hand. All right. And word to the panelists, you need to be really close on this for folks to hear. All right, let's begin again. So our first panelist is John Harrison Nichols. He is the associate editor of the Capital Times in Madison, Wisconsin. Interest to us here is that's a daily newspaper, locally owned, very progressive. And he is also just down the road from the hometown of Paul Ryan. I'm sure that he keeps Paul's feet to the fire, and uh, he is one of America's best-known progressive journalists, the author of seven books on politics, called a pioneering blogger, and is a contributor to the Progressive and the Nation magazine. We're delighted to have John with us. Well... I know well that the first thing you should do is try and get your technology right. And I, did, I was not enjoying uh, how Josie was coming across there. So uh, would somebody in the back tell me, does this sound okay? Hey, back row, look at it, rocking it back there. Ladies and gentlemen, if I had a choice and if I could people the United States Senate, I would have put Josie in. Yeah, well, it's not too late, as, he, as they say, but as you can well understand, I'm not always in charge of deciding who's, who's in the Senate. Uh, it's a delight to be with you, and it's a delight to be talking about this topic. This is, and it's a delight also to turn my phone off. There we go. It's a delight to be talking about this topic. I've been writing about it, dealing with it for the better part of 30 years. And... The interesting thing about money in politics is if you're around it a long time, you realize, um, you know, you get a perspective on how bad things could be. Because I thought it was a disaster 30 years ago. <laughs> I did. I totally, I mean, I have people say, yeah, boy, before Citizens United. No, it was horrible before Citizens United. It was a nightmare. It was an awful, dysfunctional absolutely anti-democratic system before the United States Supreme Court decided in one of the ultimate acts of judicial activism to come in and say, yeah, you've got a mess, let's make it worse. <laughs> and so, I, just to give you my perspective up front. <laughs> but I want to offer, as we discuss this, I want to offer quickly uh, a notion of how we should think about money in politics, which I, which I actually think is more important than the blaming of the individual candidate or the most horrible thing of all, the most absolutely useless thing of all, which is the anecdotal analysis of money in politics. 
Because the anecdotal analysis of money and politics will tell you, well, Donald Trump didn't spend that much last year, so it's all fine. Or Bernie Sanders raised a lot of money through small contributions, so it's all fine. That is like saying, I ate, only had salad today, so I'm a healthy eater. And then you eat whatever you want the rest of the time. It is the most absurd, it, literally the most anti-scientific, anti-logical argument. So I will not do that. I'm not going to tell you this year was worse than that year. Some years. What I will tell you is that we have a steady increase in money and politics because wealthy people and corporations figure out that it is the single best investment they can make. There's no better investment because we don't spend a fortune on our campaigns. Our campaigns are relatively, by comparison to selling toothpaste, for, for instance, they're relatively low budget. And so for a, and I've had, I've talked to, I've been to the conferences, I've been to these events with people. I, I people, they laugh at how cheaply you can influence the politics of this country. The telecommunications corporations laugh at how easy it is to influence the debate about net neutrality. The, uh, you know, you just go on any special interest. It's a joke to them that they can actually buy their way in. And one of the biggest parts of the joke, the thing that gets them amused the most, is that you can buy both parties, right? <laughs> That's, they're like, this is great, you know? <laughs> I mean, people, I go quite often to Germany to do conferences and other, around the world on, on many of these issues. People in Europe, they just, they're, they're amused. They said, no, you know, it's kind of different because in a lot of countries, you know, you have a socialist party and you have like a Christian Democrat. In America, both parties are up for sale. And, and he says, it's a very different system. And the thing is that people in the Democratic Party like to be, you know, they like to be honored when they're bought. You know, they don't, wanna, they don't want it to be, you know, crass or, or disgusting. Um, and so they like it to be, you know, have a little bit of, you know, kind of nice fuzz around it and say that they're trying to do something noble. But at the end of the day, at the end of the day, special interests in this country and wealthy people know that they can influence not an election, but something much more important, the arc of discourse in this country. So we have people all the time talk about the Koch brothers, and they say, oh, the Koch brothers are pouring money into election campaigns. It's true. But... When we did our book, Dollarocracy, we looked at what the Koch brothers do and how they spend money. And you know what? Election season is a, you know, that's like, it's like Christmas. Yeah, you spend a little more, at ele you know. But, but every day of the year, they're spending. And what they're spending on is to define the issues that you discuss at election time. And so it's much smarter to be, this is really, I'm just giving you a tip here. It's much smarter to be a billionaire to, when you're going to start out on this, and then to spend money over time so that people actually think that you could have, it would be logical to say, we've got to cut food stamps to fund a tax cut for rich people. And you're like, no, three-year-olds know that's illogical. But if you spend enough money, you can make that a legitimate part of the discourse. Similarly, yeah, we're, climate change might not be real. It's absurd, right? But of course, you can buy that with enough money over time. And the final thing that I'll suggest to you, again, these are just suggestions up front, and we'll talk more about these issues as we go along. But the final thing I'll suggest to you is that in addition to not worrying about anecdotes, not worrying about one moment, but the overall arc, understanding that the bigger issue is to buy the discourse and then to get both parties to fit narrowly within the discourse, the final thing that's really important is to understand that campaign finance in America exists now as a reflection of the collapse of our traditional media system. And traditional journalism in this country is in crisis. No serious journalist would suggest differently. And so what we have had in the United States over the last 30 years is a collapse of the daily newspaper, which is the, the primary newsroom, the newsroom with a crowd of people in a town. Now, many towns still have a daily newspaper, but it's a shred of what it was. It's much smaller. They don't cover as much as they did, and they tell you, well, you know what? It's okay. We now have a combined city council, county government, school board, state government reporter. <laughs> right? You know, Josie will tell you this. They all do this. Now, they say, you know, it turns out government's just government, so you just mix it all together. And the fact of the matter is, they have diminished coverage 
of real politics and real governance. And then they say, well, yeah, it's okay because TV and radio. TV and radio never did a full-scale job, and they do much less now because of changes in federal law as regards to Telecommunications Act of 96 and also a host of other changes as regards to television. So and then you say finally, well, the Internet will fill the void because there's, you know, nothing like some good fake news to get an election going. <laughs> the Internet, when we studied this a couple of years ago, we found that for every 10 reporters who were let go by traditional newspapers, you were getting one reporter hired for an Internet journalism job. The Internet does not fill the void. So as we've seen the collapse of traditional media, and we will have a next media, we'll get there, but it's going to take time. In this void, we have horrible coverage of elections. It's not done well. It's done personality-based rather than issue-based. It doesn't go deep. People less and less are aware of who their city council member is, who their school board member is, than at any time in modern history. So in this context, when you then flow in tens of billions of dollars in the off-year and in the on-year election cycle, when you have this money flowing in at, this immense, at these immense amounts, wow, everyone's calling. Um, but as this money flows in, I know that's going to work. Don't worry, I've been you a lot of times, sister. <laughs> so solidarity. Yes. But all, the final thing I'll just tell you in the simplest way is that what happens is as you dial down journalism, as you dial up money, money has a much more powerful role in defining the discourse today than it did in the past. And so if we don't do something about money in politics, if we don't recognize it, it will increasingly define everything about our politics and make it much more a reflection of billionaires and corporations than of citizens. That's not a good thing. Thank you. Great start. All right, can you hear me back there? Good. All right, our second panelist is Michael Frank. Michael is the director of the Washington, D.C. program of the Hoover Institute and was previously with the Heritage Foundation. He's also on the board of directors of Capital Research Center, which calls itself America's investigative think tank. And they specialize in examining how foundations, charities, and nonprofits do policy and advocacy work, which according to their website says it's a claim that most donors had not intended. And in fact, the donors find perhaps abhorrent. Well, none of that happens in Colorado, <laughs> but we would like it still to welcome Michael to share with you his thoughts. Please help me and join Michael Frank. Thanks, Josie. Uh, let me see. Can you hear me back there? All right. Um, I'll keep my remarks brief. I'll hit a few main points and look forward to, I think, a few, you know, probably boring, non-emotional questions later, right? <laughs> um, let me tell you a story first that I think illustrates a big, a bigger point I want to make. Um, it was probably in um, 2001 or two in Health Affairs magazine or journal. Uh, Bruce Vladek wrote a column and he, or an article. He was the... Um, he ran the Medicare and the Medicaid programs under President Clinton for a number of years. He was a recognized healthcare expert. Um, and he introduced his, his, his reminiscing on what his experiences were and what his takeaways were from running uh, two federal health programs that probably at the time, you know, were about four or five hundred billion a year uh, when you include some of the state money. And one of the points he made is, is despite thinking he really understood the inner workings of the healthcare system, he was astonished at how in Medicare, every single corner of that very complex uh, program had developed a little um, set of uh, associations and organizations that were set up solely to lobby on that one element of Medicare, mostly the different aspects of Medicare reimbursement. And he dubbed it the Medicare Industrial Complex. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I thought that was a great way to put it. And if you've been around Washington long enough, uh, I'm not going to tell you how long I've been around Washington <laughs> at this point. I had a round-numbered birthday recently, which is uh, still plaguing me. Um, you have a transportation industrial complex. You have an education industrial complex. You have a tax code industrial complex, a trade industrial complex, and on and on and on. And I guess the point I, I want to make 
visit, as Bruce Vladek wrote, you know, he was besieged with visits from rural hospital associations and from disease-specific groups and from medical technology sectors of the healthcare economy and from different physician groups, all of whom were uh, armed with economists, former members of Congress, former Hill staff, uh, you know, lawyers out the wazoo, whatever the wazoo is, and, and they came in with these presentations to members, especially the guys and gals on the committees of jurisdiction, to lobby for their little piece of that pie. A lot of money is being spent on that. Mm -hmm. Multiply that out by every conceivable area where the federal government now is, is involved, whether it's in a regulatory basis or a programmatic basis, which may involve funding issues. And you have a, re a, a regular daily army of nice people who come to Washington, usually with name tags on, and you see them in the elevators, and they've all got their first name in very large font, and it tends to be some county or state association of this or that, or some industry group of this or that, and they're set out. They know who their member of Congress is, and by gosh, they're going to find him or her, right? And then they're going to sit down with that member and staff and explain their points that they want to get across. And this happens by the tens of thousands of times every month, on, just on Capitol Hill, it also happens, state legislative uh, bodies, a long time ago, I worked for the New York State Senate. It was every bit as sophisticated and aggressive there, and that's a long time ago. It's probably a lot worse today. Uh, so that, that's the backdrop. The more areas government gets involved in, the more uh, reasons different categories of people have to want to try to influence how that involvement takes shape for whatever, in whatever direction. Some of those directions you guys will love. Some of those directions you guys will abhor, okay? But that's the nature of that beast. And so if you look at maybe just a number of federal programs in existence that hand out money, and there's a big uh, website called the Catalog of Federal Domestic Assistance, which is a handbook, a guide to anybody trying to apply for federal money, there's something like 2,300 federal programs now that get appropriations every year. And it used to be well, well below 2,000, and that was just about six, seven years ago, okay? So all of these programs have an industrial complex set up on the ground and in the states and in the counties and in the think tanks and in the universities and so on to come and get a piece of that pie, all right? Um, another point is that a lot of times you can have affect massive change with little or no money. And one example of that uh, I would suggest is Uber. And when they came online, they were kind of a disruptive force. They ignored the niceties of local uh, politics to the point where I remember in D.C. <coughs> one day the city council <coughs> had some kind of an emergency meeting because they were suddenly realizing that there was this new entity in town that was taking away business from their licensed taxi cab drivers. And when they called it, noticed, noticed the hearing, Uber sent out a notice to everybody whose emails they had, and all of a sudden the city council and the mayor were getting besieged with literally thousands and thousands of emails saying, hey, I like this service, leave it alone. And I don't know how much it cost to send out that notice to all their customers, but it was very really cheap relative to a lot of the other things, and it made a big difference. And D.C. City Council and the mayor backed down, and, it, and they let this new disruptive technology and new competitors flourish in D.C. and the surrounding areas. And that storyline, I think with a notable exception probably of Austin, Texas, has been repeated over and over again, not just here but around the world, for relatively little bits of money. Another example of that would be, um, I think, the whole tweet effect. And you look at some of the power that someone like a Trump had just to tweet and get free earned media. He got apparently $1.2 billion of earned media uh, in the last election cycle, according to one calculation. He has 26.7 million uh, followers. I think Secretary Clinton has something like 16 or 14 million followers. Uh, that's peanuts compared to, you know, Katy Perry and... Jason, what's his name, Bieber, Justin Bieber, you know, all these people um, who have 80, 90, 95 million followers on Twitter. But that's a relatively inexpensive way to reach a whole lot of people and to bypass uh, screening and filters that, that the candidate may not like. It's a powerful tool, and I think it's going to start making a lot of the traditional forms of financial expenditure and politics uh, moot if it hasn't already done so. Um, and one other minor point I'll raise is that in healthcare, you, I mentioned the Medicare, Medicaid um, industrial complex and all the fiefdoms. There's another federal program 
that um, I was part of for a number of years when I worked on Capitol Hill, the Federal Employee Health Benefits Plan, and I'm sure some folks here may have worked in the federal government and are still getting uh, coverage through that program. It covers about nine million lives. And I, honestly, I was on the receiving end of every conceivable lobbying pitch when I was up there. I was a policy director for the majority leader most recently um, in the House. And y you hear from all these folks, but I never got one visit, n never, from the FEHBP world. That was sort of a self-propelling, really cleanly designed federal program that for some reason has never engendered a lot of uh, controversy or lobbying one way or the other. And so it's possible for the federal government to get involved in something at a fairly large scale, I mean, 9 million insured lives is not peanuts, and to do so without uh, in kind of inciting you know, all of the lobbying and all the frenzy and all the campaign donations that usually that entails. Um, well, on that point, I mean, I'll just finish up and uh, welcome your questions, but I, I do think it's important to try to put in context the way these systems work, when you're, especially if you have a chance to work on the Hill or know people who did, ask them what it's like. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you, get, you get all kinds of uh, visits coming from folks who have a lot of money. And honestly, it's not clear to me after all these years that it's some kind of automatic correlation with how much money is spent and, and success or failure. I, I think it really is more, um, it helps people get in the door and that's usually a function of where the hired guns have worked before and who they know, and that can help. But at the margins, that, you know, in the scheme of things, with all the money that is being spent, that's really a, a rounding error. It's even below a rounding error. So I'd be happy to uh, expand upon the firsthand experience and what it feels like uh, at some later point. But uh, I just want to put those ideas on the table uh, and uh, look forward to your questions. So thanks again. Appropriate to this topic, we've saved our third speaker because he has not only the final authority for this topic, but as yeah. you can see when you learn about this, the great experience he needs. And our final speaker is James Viotter. James toured the country with a 1950s genre rock and roll band, <laughs> then worked in the livestock industry in Louisiana and oil rigs. So what better credentials could you have? <laughs> he also now is a professor at Loyola University, has done extensive work in Chile, working on journalism and the judicial system. It's my pleasure to introduce James. And then let me just say, before he begins, that I'm excited to see that on my app, that you all have sent in lots of questions already. So um, once we finish with James, I'm gonna ask the panel to respond quickly to one another, and then we're gonna move my, right to questions. So James Fialger. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, my background suits me for something, and if my parents were still alive, they would say, uh, we hope he eventually finds it. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I'd like to make um, two points uh, for our general topic. One, an anti-money um, in politics point, and the other, an anti-anti-money in politics point. So let, let me start with first uh, my concern about money in politics. And, it, and it's not so much a direct concern as about politics, but it is the linchpin of American politics. Um, the great Clinton Rossiter, political scientist at Cornell, wrote about the American political experiment, no America without democracy, no democracy without politics, no politics without two parties. And he then further said, parties are the places that responsible men go to do politics always remembering that they are not party men, they are political men, and this is where they do to go their work, to do their work to serve the ends of government. And money in politics, too much money in politics, and of course there's the weasel word, too much, mm -hmm. does have, I think, a deleterious effect on the two-party system in ways that, that perhaps uh, my co-panelists can elucidate, but I just have an instinct that as more and more happens outside of the two-party system, 
the, the two-party system uh, weakens in um, inappropriate and unhappy ways. So that's my anti-money point. My anti-anti-money point is uh, to worry about the effect of legislators and their legislation on a robust free speech culture. And of course, for centuries, ever since the agitation over the Sedition Act of 1798, up through the civil rights marches, uh, and then on today through campus protests, the, the linchpin of our free speech culture has always been that the cure for speech you don't like is more speech and that at the center of the Supreme Court's most highly protective standard of review for speech, because there are different categories of speech, obscenity gets less protection, the highest category, the most protected, is political speech. And so at the core of McCain-Feingold, the Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act of 2002, was electioneering speech, that is speech 30 or 60 days before elections or general elections that mentioned a candidate by name. That's all. And so that, that was shut down. Well, that, that's fairly abhorrent to the idea of a robust free speech culture where the cure for the speech you don't like is more speech. Get, get your speech out there. Uh, in the end, for a government like ours, Lincoln's government of, by, and for the people, in a government premised on popular consent, it's crucial that legislators are not permitted to decide who gets to say what, when. The Supreme Court, in the McConnell opinion, its first bite at McCain-Feingold, where it, it upheld the electioneering speech ban, said, well, we defer to the legislature on this, because they've made a considered judgment, that is Congress, that restricting this speech will lead to a better informed political process. To which even my law students said, well, how do they know that? And of course, the Supreme Court wasn't saying they know that. They were saying that Congress knows that. And we're going to defer to that judgment, which asking congressmen whether they want to cut down on political speech 60 days before an election <laughs> is like asking law professors, would you like if we don't have any student evaluations of your class until 10 years after graduation? <laughs> well, of course we don't want that speech. And Congress is in very much the same boat when they vote on things like McCain-Feingold, which in the end shows a great distrust, even disdain, for Lincoln's people who, given the chance, will eventually see and do the right. Thank you. Thanks, James. Can you hear me? Yes. Good. All right, so we're going to give the panelists just a few minutes to respond to the comments of their colleagues, and then we're going to go right to questions. And I want to mention here that, of course, the app is one option, and we're also doing the note cards. So if you are interested in submitting a question, um, our um, producer is handing out note cards here. So let's move right into seeing whether or not any of you have comments you want to respond to from your fellow panelists. I'll, I'll start and say that, can everybody hear me? Sounded good? I'll start by saying that I, I'm impressed by what my fa fellow panelists said. This is a good, we've set down a good basis for a discussion here. A couple of areas, that, just to, to add a, you know, some of the footnotes to what we've discussed. Um, you're right that Uber in D.C. did, you know, send out some tweets and things and make some things happen. But now Uber's one of the top hires of lobbyists in the United States. They hire former politicians everywhere because they actually figured out that didn't work as well as hiring lobbyists and spending money on campaigns. So the notion that we've created some sort of, you know, social media driven counter to money in politics or lobbying, as I think you well know, is, is not the case. In fact, uh, it, it, social media, to the extent that it's a part of lobbying and it's part of politics, now is being quickly colonized by political consultants. They actually have conferences and give awards for who uses it best 
to advance a special interest in the process. So we should be a little conscious that social media may not be the cavalry coming over the hill to save us. Um, the other thing, the other notion is this idea that, um, that money helps you get through the door. And I, boy, do I know that, right? Uh, Paul Simon said over 20 years ago, the former senator from Illinois, says, you know, I, I'm one of the biggest supporters of, of small d democracy, citizen empowerment in, in Congress, without a doubt, against big money at every turn. But boy, when I get back to my office at 930 at night and I've got a pack of calls that have come in, somebody in my office, I don't know who, has usually put the call from the big donor on top. <laughs> and, and as I think of, can I, I could stay here till midnight and make some calls uh, back to people about this big issue. And as good a guy as I am, I don't think I'm going to call the woman down in Collinsville. Probably going to call the big donor. And that's somebody who's on the good side of this. So getting in the door, absolutely true. But here's where the problem comes in. It's what they get in the door to talk about. We live in, in a country where the answer to our, and I know we may get disagreement on this, but our answer to our health care challenges in this country is single-payer Medicare for all health care, everybody in, nobody out, like every other place in the world. You don't have to, I'm not going for the applause line there, but, but um, that's the answer. It's an easy answer, and it's the one answer that's off the table, right? And it's off the table because massive amounts of money are spent to shape a discourse that puts logical answers off the table. Similarly, the solution to our education problems is not distance learning that, that isolates rural kids more. It's not shutting rural public schools. It's not, you know, creating some voucher that, you know, go off running around. It's actually to fund public education and get serious about it like countries like Finland and Germany and places around the world do, right? I'm telling you, again, you know, you're taking my time, people. But the bottom <laughs> line is, the bottom line is that basic concept is actually challenged. It's viewed as sort of like one side of the debate. And this is what money in politics does. It makes us stupid. It makes us have debates about things where we actually take major issues out of the discourse, out of the debate, even though polling shows most people favor it. And my final comment. You know, I love my colleague from, you know, Loyola who, who takes us back to Lincoln, but I'm going all the way to Jefferson. <laughs> imperfect man, we we're all imperfect, but that first line, all men are created equal. I like to think that Jefferson might even have thought women should be a part of it. Um, but, 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 this is the thing. We're not talking about equal speech. We're not talking about a situation where everybody in this room is given a hundred bucks and you can throw it into politics how you like. We are talking about a point where if you are on food stamps and you want to be a part of that discourse about whether food stamps will continue to be, to be funded, your ability to influence that debate as compared to the billionaire who wants a tax break is so comically unequal that even if you get together all the people who share your circumstance, you still will be shouted down. And the absurd construct that a child might have their school lunch program cut to fund a tax break for a billionaire is treated seriously in this country. Money in politics makes us stupid. And I don't want to have a stupid country, and I don't want to have any more stupid debates. All right, Neri, you're using up my time. Come on, Neri. So the, one of the first points I was making, and I'll elaborate a little bit more on it, is about the fiefdoms and the industrial complex uh, thing is... Which, by the way, I totally agree with. Yeah, yeah. it's... So, but your point about Uber is a good one, and it even extends, go back a little further, to Microsoft, for example, became a very dynamic, large entity in the, by the early 90s um, without having even one Washington-based lobbyist. And then at some point... Uh, the federal government kind of discovered Microsoft and the antitrust division and justice began uh, to look in, at it and thinking that it was violating antitrust laws and was starting to do mount lawsuits and so on, 
And guess what they did? They started hiring uh, lobbyists, and they created a big office, and it, it only gets bigger. And I guess the point is that a lot of these things grow up uh, because the federal government gets involved in areas and has enormous amounts of power over the outcomes, the business outcomes, the potential for growth, or you know, how, you know, how markets are shaped and so on, that cause the affected parties to want to find a way to do something to push back and to defend their uh, perceived self-interest, okay? And that leads to one other quick point. The definition of, a, of corporations includes nonprofits. So you talk about whether it's unions, whether it's uh, AFL, whether it's like Planned Parenthood, NAACP, National Head Start Association. These are nonprofit corporations that would get picked up in your perceived solution, right? So what do you do? How, how do you enforce a lot of these things? How do you take all that money out? And if you were to nationalize, what, 18.5% of our GDP in healthcare, my suspicion is that at some point, some groups of Americans would decide they don't like the way it's, it's turning out and might say, hey, we need to combine our resources and our forces because any one of us alone is not gonna be able to make our points and get our voices heard. <clears throat> and they may wanna fight back against some element of how a national healthcare uh, program, <clears throat> we spend about three uh, plus trillion dollars a year on health these days, how that's being managed. And that uh, gets to the core First Amendment freedoms of, of a, of a, in a democracy. And being able to form associations and then defend your self-interest is pretty important. And I guess the bottom line is, if you want less money in politics, I say, get the government out of a lot of these areas or make their involvement really clean. And you know, flat tax, for example, would be tough to get in place because of all the affected parties. But once it's there, if you can just lock it down and you have low rates and, and a very predictable tax situation, you're probably gonna have a much better, like more like the FEHVP model, you're not gonna have the need to come in and lobby and get advantages through tax, uh, change, tax code changes. So I'll, I'll leave it at there and look forward to your questions. James? Yeah, to uh, Mr. Franks, is this coming out? Or should I try this? Um, or, yeah. Two microphones. You can see the rock and roll star. Two yeah. drop the mic endings. <laughs> so uh, to to Mr. Frank's point about um, the way McCain-Feingold was phrased, it didn't just cover nasty old business corporations. Some of the listed parties who joined United as defendants were the Sierra Club and the NAACP. They're covered also mm -hmm. by limitations on expenditures and contributions for political speech 60 days before an election. Um, and I think that's the instinct of politicians. We'll mow them all down because some of them sometime are gonna say something before the election that's gonna cost me the election. It's the law professor's instinct. Those pesky student evaluations, what do they know? <laughs> student evaluations just make the students stupid. Um, and of course, that's an instinct that should be resisted. And it was resisted by the framing and ratification of the First Amendment that put Congress shall make no law on freedom of speech and press. And McCain-Feingold is a law. Jefferson, Madison, Adams, they all knew the instincts of politicians in a republic would be to insulate themselves from criticism in the same way that at faculty meetings law professors complain about those pesky student evaluations. It's a natural human instinct, and it needs to be resisted in the name of government by popular consent. You've got to be able to learn whatever there is to learn in order to be fully informed, and no legislator is gonna help you to be fully informed. It's not in that legislator's self-interest. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks to the University of Colorado for sponsoring this conference, and we always want to put students first. So I'd like, I have lots of questions that have come in, but I want to also recognize students here who might have a question. The first student question that came in my app is that third parties are disproportionately impacted by campaign finance laws. What do you as panelists recommend how would you respond to that statement, and what do you recommend might be a solution? 
Yeah, as long as we're going down, we're, yeah. we're doing this. At some point, we'll reverse it, right? And and that'll have a deleterious effect. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll go from then we will be going from the ridiculous to the sublime to. <laughs> you're using up um, your time, John. Oh, it's okay. We're just talking. <laughs> so I'm not a Democrat or a Republican. I think the one of the biggest crises in the American experiment is that we have a two-party system. I've never been a fan of it. It's not written about in the Constitution. In fact, we were just talking about Mr. Madison and some of these other folks. They were terrified of, of the grouping of people into uh, narrow partisan sectors. And so, yes, you're absolutely right that the current campaign finance system is disastrous for third parties. And one of the things that I think is important to understand is that other countries organize elections that are competitive, fair, with a lot of speech, and not, they, don't shout, they don't let somebody shout somebody else down just because they're rich. And these are hell holes, like Norway. And um, free, speech, free speech nightmare zones, like, I don't know, Iceland. Um, and, and so it, it is possible to have multi-party democracy that works. And the beginning of that is you have to address the massive inflow of money and this industrial complex that gets created around it. And until we have campaign finance reform in this country, I will tell you this, I will promise you this, you are not going to have a multi-party system. You're not going to have third parties. And I say this with sorrow and as somebody who in every election cycle goes out of my way to write about the third parties, treat them seriously, have led fights to get them into the debates. Um, but this this money in politics and media, money and media industrial complex, negates multi-party democracy in the United States. And you know who thinks that's a terrible idea? The American people who in poll after poll after poll say they want more parties, poll after poll after poll so they want more people in the debates. That's what we need in this country and we don't get it because our politics has been corporatized. It is literally run by the politicians and the people who pay for them. And until we start to break that with a real campaign finance reform, we are not going to get to multi-party democracy. <laughs> um, third parties. One point I would make and agree with, I think, here is that um, there's an institutionalization of parties in many ways, you know, the, the financing of campaigns and conventions and that sort of thing. Um, I think by definition, uh, Just saying that. Uh, it wasn't you this year. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Simply by saying that, you're being silent. Uh oh, it's a conspiracy. Val Vladimir Putin maybe <laughs> right? heard me. Um, so I'll speak really wait, loud, wait. but I'll, I'll be let's quick here. Let me figure out what's going on. You want me to wait? Well, we got a, our producer. Is it? Is this a um, fire alarm? What's going on? Somebody walked through the door. Emergency door. Okay. Well, you got to follow your children. Yeah. Okay. So just in a nutshell, um, I think there's a lot to be said for not Hooray. having Thank the you. feds not institutionalize uh, financial support to the major parties. And I would, I never check that box. You know, do you check the box? You know, the, the one on the tax return. It's down about, I think it was under 20%. A number of years ago, I think they just changed it so that now you have to actually check it if you want to fund. I think the presumption is that nobody wants to fund these things. Um, anyway, so I would get that out of there. And, I, and some of the laws do have an implicit bias to having two parties. I mean, commission structures and that sort of thing. Um, you have uh, appointments to the commissions, the independent commissions that are the majority leader, the minority leader, pretty much in each party might get a, a certain number of appointees, and then the president gets some. That implicitly suggests that there's only two parties, right? And that you ha if, if you're part of a minority party, you have to um, caucus or align in some way with either the majority party or the minority party. And I think some of those biases are uh, something to look at. I don't know how to solve any of that, but I, I think they're, I, I don't think the government should be playing favorites with respect to the formation and the uh, perseverance of parties. So the, uh, the founding generation worried about multitudinous factions that they read about in history in, in Athens and in Rome, this, this roiling 
war of each against all, and the architecture of the Constitution was designed in large part, part to, to prevent any faction from taking over the government. And in a sense, the two-party system has done that because the factions have found a place to live, and it's not the war of each against all. And as another great historian, Richard Hofstadter, said, we do have a multi-party system in the United States. Third parties, he wrote, are the honeybees of the American political system. They sting, and after they sting, they die, but they leave behind what they were stinging about so that the populists and the progressives join the Democratic Party. The Know Nothing Party with its emphasis on professionalized government and civil service reform, they join the Republican Party. So we do have three-party systems. To the extent there was a consumer advocacy party through Ralph Nader, they've, those people have found a home in the Democratic Party. So we do have a multi-party system, but we do not have a parliamentary system. Uh, there's lots of parties forming all the time, and like the good old honeybee, they sting and leave their mark, and, and then they die, but their mark is left in that party. Okay, so one quick, to build off that real quickly, in today's Congress, you do have, for example, Freedom Caucus, mm -hmm. you have, um, used to, in the early 80s, you had Bull Weevils, mm -hmm. and you had, you had the Blue Dogs. Sometimes they actually unite around some shared issue and create a big uh, sting for a while. Sometimes they become the veto point, which prevents a bill going forward. Other times, they have their uh, concerns addressed by the majority party that they're part of, and they can go forward. But you are within each party now, emerging factions that act and behave very independent of the formal party structure. Part of that reason is the ability of an outsider to circumvent local party uh, structures, county parties and so on, raise money, get on the radar screen, and sometimes win primaries. Okay, does it, that a lot of the disproportionate number of people in the Freedom Caucus got to, into the House in that way. Okay, and so the more of that that happens, the more independence they exhibit to members of their own party leadership, which used to be unheard of. They, they don't want to be on a quote unquote a committee, ways and means, appropriations, armed services, if it means they have to sub, uh, subjugate themselves to their leadership. So there's like these independent pods, but they're still part of the major party technically, but they do act day to day in a very, very independent way. As long as we're going, I'm gonna, I'm gonna agree with that, but I wanna throw one other element in here. What we're talking about, as you're hearing, is, a, is at the macro level, right? what's happening, how they group once they're in Congress, um, and the notion of the sting against the big beast. Um, but at, at the micro level where we live, right, our choices are incredibly limited. And our choices in November are ridiculously limited. And, and the end result is that most of us, this is not just about the two-party system per se, but it's gerrymandering of districts around this country, we end up in a situation, do you know who is the biggest supporter of gerrymandering? You know, you know, like which party, I'm gonna, I'm gonna expose here, I'm gonna expose, which party is the biggest advocate for gerrymandering? Both of them. <laughs> <laughs> because they literally, people who hate on each other, Freedom Caucus members and Progressive Caucus members, the one point where they can sometimes get together and sit in a room and sort something out is when they figure out how to make sure that their personal elections are not competitive. Mm -hmm. and, and so, again, I go to my core point. Money in politics underpins an awfully lot of this, and then a whole host of structural interventions take place to prevent us from having what we want and need, which is an ongoing multi-party system. And I will tell you that the Socialist Party, which did sting and gave us protections for workers, ultimately, and social security and all sorts of other things, put those issues on the, on the agenda initially. That social par socialist party that stung was a viable political entity for 30 years, from 1900 into the 1930s. It was a reality. It didn't win always, but it was a reality. You, this notion of just stinging is insufficient. People ought to have choices that are real on a year-in, year-out basis where parties can develop candidates and can develop messages and have a real impact over time. And so I genuinely believe that this is something that ought to be at the center of our political discourse, not the edges of it. Thank you. One, one quick point, one quick point. Somebody call Bernie Sanders and tell him the socialists have no home in the Democratic Party. <laughs> uh, Bernie sits as an independent who caucuses yeah. with the Democrats. Yeah. And but, but he, is um, I, he is indeed, but I would just counsel 
I would just counsel um, that we, the socialists may, some social democrats may have a place in the Democratic Party, although it got a little difficult come convention time. There are lots of folks who are sending in questions related to this, and many of you are asking this question. Who's at the forefront of campaign finance reform? And for folks in the audience who have sent in this question, where is, where should someone direct their support to best affect change? So let me take that important question and toss that out. I don't know who's in, who's a leader on this. I think it's more um, a lot of the party, the Democratic Party structure seems to want reforming that. I, but I don't know who the actual marquee leader is if anyone has emerged. Okay. That's John? You know, this is the problem, and Josie, you know the answer to this, which is that there are many campaign finance reforms. You know, in my, mother, in my father's house there are many mansions. And, and the, the, the simple reality is that it depends on the reform you want. I happen to favor a constitutional amendment. I believe we should settle this issue. No, I, it, it, I believe we should settle this issue once and for all. And, and I do believe that it will keep retching around in the courts. And so I favor a constitutional amendment. There are groups such as Move to Amend, Free Speech for People, and others. Both those groups very active in constitutional amendment across this country. 17 states have now voted in favor of it. Uh, more than 600 communities, I expect, Boulder. Um, and so those two groups are way out front. As regards people in Congress, I was going to mention, if we had a media that actually covered Congress, you would know these names. Uh, but uh, John, uh, Congressman Sarbanes from Maryland, S-A-R-B-A-N-E-S, I hope I have got that right. Yeah. Um, Congressman Sarbanes from Maryland has really, really carved this out as his mission. And I would respectfully urge you to go to uh, check out his website if you want to see somebody who's proposing a lot. And then uh, Senator Udall from uh, not your state of Colorado, uh, but from New Mexico, uh, has really staked out a lot of turf on this as well. Bernie Sanders we can mention also. But uh, if you want to see people kind of day in, day out, putting a lot of work in as leaders on it in Congress, I think Sarbanes and Udall have been very out front. And also, I'll mention a very conservative Republican, Walter Jones from North Carolina, one of the most conservative people in Congress who has been supportive of a constitutional amendment to get money out of politics because he says as an honest conservative, that, that he knows that the money is corrupting the process. As a distant, dishonest conservative. I, you know I had to do that. So as many of you know, here in Colorado, we had um, a move to put in place campaign finance reform, and we have really quite restrictive uh, caps on donations for statewide races. And I think in some ways we feel like that has served us well. But I want to talk to the panel and ask you to respond about what's happening in states with campaign finance reform. I think it's easy to feel a little smug that maybe you have something in place. And yet, John, I think in Wisconsin we're seeing <laughs> that you all haven't always had such great success. Want to yeah. talk about that? Sure, very quickly. Um, look, state-based campaign finance reform uh, runs into the same, uh, you know, I don't know whether it's, what kind of saw it is, but it's, a, it's a, whatever nasty saw is in a sawmill. Uh, in fact, is states are getting upset all the time. And uh, we have a – the thing about some of the wealthy investors in politics is they figured out a long time ago that the best way to, to intervene is to move at all levels, local, state, and national. When we charted the spending on the 2012 uh, election cycle, all the public interest groups said six billion, six to seven billion was spent. When we actually went in and just pulled the reports on states, state, local elections, referendums, and judicial elections, we got it up over 11 billion in from from six to seven billion. We got it up over 11, close to 12 billion in a matter of minutes. And so there's massive money flowing into the states, and by and large, they're doing so as the way that my colleague has said that you know they're finding they're coming through associations, they're coming through other vehicles, not just the parties and candidates, although immense amounts of money goes to candidates. So I don't see a superiority of a state that says, "Oh, we figured this thing out." Now there are a couple states. Arizona still experiments with a clean money system where you can opt into a system. And amazingly enough, there are Republicans and Democrats who still get elected on that system, and it works. Maine has experimented with it to some extent. They seem to have some resilience. New York City actually has an interesting model that has worked to some extent. Um, but I would counsel you that, that 
the, the best answer on campaign finance reform is to try everything at every level. Look for your, look for your approaches that way, work local, state, and national. But also always be on the watch because there's going to be ways to get around it. Money is like water. And if you've ever had your house flooded, you're amazed by the power of water and you're amazed by the places it can go. And, um, and so I would counsel on that. And finally, on the state of Wisconsin where I come from, Wisconsin's a lot like Colorado. We feel very superior quite often. Um, and we don't even have mountains. <laughs> However, um, we, we feel rather smug right up until we have an election in which uh, Scott Walker gets elected governor. And, um, and so the only, and by the way, Scott Walker was born in Colorado, just so you know. Oh. Um, but with that said, I will only tell you what we found in Wisconsin when we started to look at what happened in the state of Wisconsin, which had been a very evenly divided state, went back and forth, Republican, Democrat, and also had very many moderate Republicans and moderate Democrats, is this massive inflow of money that we had in 2010 in the 2012 recall, 2014, and just exponentially more than we had ever seen spent in the state, was definitional. It, it really had a profound impact. And that's not to underestimate. Scott Walker's a good politician. There's other people. You know what I mean? This isn't just money. But it really supercharges things. And I will tell you, in Wisconsin, our experience, I don't know about Colorado's as well, um, one name, DeVos. Betsy DeVos's money in Wisconsin pr played a massive role in influencing our legislative elections and our statewide elections. And I don't know what she's doing now, um, <laughs> but I understand she's involved in government in some way. Um. State level campaign finance reform. I guess you can um, cabin that around candidates and d contributions to the candidates, but it seems like you've got an electron problem, uh, an electron problem with respect to uh, outside resources coming in and influencing. So if you if you're in Nebraska and you purchase all kinds of uh, ad space or real estate on different websites that are heavily used in say the neighboring Colorado you can impact and get on the radar of a lot of voters with a lot of money, and, but you're never s touching the state, right, except the people who log on. So it seems like that's another, that's a hole in any kind of state level reform. So um, this is gonna be counterintuitive. I know everyone here knows Molly Ivins, and, and one of her great lines about my home state of Louisiana was when someone asked her, well, is there much political corruption in Texas? And she said, oh, yeah, tons of it. But with Mexico on one side and Louisiana on the other side, you never even notice us. <laughs> <laughs> so, so to cite my home state for uh, a reform is sort of counterintuitive. <laughs> and it's a very small reform, so it hasn't cramped our style too much. Um, but, but I do agree with John. There's a problem with money, and I think there's a way to approach it without talking about electioneering speech and without touching political speech. And, and that is to much more closely watch the incumbents mm -hmm. and their duck camps and their global initiatives mm -hmm. and their sea cruise junkets and all of that sort of stuff, um, which doesn't have anything to do with regulating electioneering speech at all. But boy, there's a lot of money um, going those directions. And Louisiana has taken steps to, to look at that money. And you know, whose who's brother-in-law gets what paving contracts for the highways and things like that? that? That can have a great beneficial effect without touching political speech at all. As we're bouncing around a little here, and I just want to really emphasize, when we talk about campaign finance reform, one of the biggest mistakes we do is that we constrain it, right? We say, yeah, we're really just looking at what's spent on elections. And that is such a true point. You know, you really have to look at the whole lobbying, this, this, this industrial complex, because real reform, right, if money is like water and it can flood any place, if you do campaign finance reform, there, there are other vehicles that are found. And so we really need to look at it. We need to include media issues as well, how we create a functional media in this country. And I, but I did remember as we were talking here, there's one other wonderful model that I really invite you to study. That's Minnesota. And they allow people to take a, campaign, a small campaign contribution off their taxes, right? You can knock, like, I think 50 bucks off, or there's some little system they've got. And what is really interesting is for working class people who are running, 
And I don't know the system well enough, so I invite you to check it out. But basically, for working class people who are running for office the first time, they can get friends, neighbors, and family to you know, do this, and they can raise a little chunk of money, uh, and, and the people aren't – they're not going to their – working class friends and neighbors and saying, you know, can I get up 50 bucks from you? It would be very, very hard to do. So there are ways that states can create a model that is not, doesn't err toward one party or the other, doesn't err toward one candidate or another, but is in fact actually kind of entrepreneurial that allows for, in especially local races and low down ballot races, for people to get a little funding together. That's one innovation, and there are a lot of them. This next question, I think, goes at the heart of why we're all here and why this topic is on the agenda and so important. And this questioner asks this, um, how can citizens really make a difference? He says, or she says, um, I've signed petitions, I've marched, I've protested, and yes, money is a part of it, but what do you as panelists really f have to tell me about how people can really have impact. So let's get to this, heart of the matter. Well, I, I think the, the, the ground level is the, is the best place to start, local politics. And so we're in a state which has a, a unique um, cannabis culture, right? And that, <laughs> that, that, that didn't start at the national level. Now, now the feds could, could squelch that culture, but that's for the federalism panel. But um, I, I have friends who are in politics, and, and I think we all do, and, and what they remember and, and what they respond to are people that actually walk in their office. And I'm going to leaflet for you, and I'd like you to think about this. And, 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 and as Tip O'Neill said, all politics is local anyway. So I, I would say starting at the local level and expect to have a small impact, but it's a local impact, it, and, and friends and neighbors – will enjoy it. I, I think that's, you know, get, it, get in small. It's like going to Vegas. Get in small before you get in big. And, and you, you learn your skills that, that way too. And especially if you're talking about new people starting, they need shoe leather starting in politics. And that's, that's a, a very good way for everybody to be able to get involved. Sweat equity. <laughs> yeah, I, I would agree with the, uh, uh, Jim's point about walking into an office and making your point of view, no, and that's, that's at the micro individual level what you can do. But I would also add per a previous exchange that aligning your uh, point of view with those of like-minded citizens, whether they're neighbors or just fellow Americans, uh, is also important. So when you join an organization uh, that has a, a point of view and is trying to move it, that can be either something that's overtly in the political process and engages in campaigns and takes out ads and so on. Or it can really, it can be an organization that is helping develop a solution to the things that you, you're bothered by, that you think can be improved upon. And that you, you, the power of multiple people who share a perspective, pooling their resources is really, um, is, is something that's, don't mistake how important that is. When, when you're working on a, a hill, people come in and they're part of one of these groups, especially when the group is clearly not kind of, uh, where they're just not ornaments in, a, in an organization, that they're real, uh, real people and the organization is more of a bottom-up operation. That really does register with members of Congress and it's along the same principle as these days when you, you know, you, it's always been the case, there's like a spectrum of communication with members. And if you have a personal visit that you take time to do, that's kind of at one end if it's a handwritten letter, clearly, you know, a, a personal missive from the citizen voter to the member, that's close to that end. The, the one we are e most easily not paying attention to is just some kind of a click and send thing that it doesn't involve a lot of work. It could be manufactured. There's no clear indication that you actually did it. Uh, and so to the extent that it's a bottom-up organization, the, those organizations, I think, tend to carry more clout with st smart members and staff because they see, oh, we have 1,100 people from our congressional district that are part of this, and they took the time to donate to it. They're involved with it. They're sending me copies of essays or studies that were done by that group. That kind of involvement's important. Don't, if you can get your something you've read that's influenced you into the inbox of either the member or the staffer who works with that member, that's a real important moment in, in this uh, system. So I would urge you to find ways to penetrate the system that, like that. 
You know who I love? Nuns. <laughs> Nuns are cool because they believe everybody can be saved. <laughs> and so when nuns go to lobby, they visit everybody. And some years ago, some nuns that I knew were lobbying against the School of the Americas, which is an institution where it was believed by a lot of folks that, that dictators and, and death squads and a lot of other folks in Latin America got a little bit too much instruction on how to uh, oppress people. And the nuns were particularly upset with this. In fact, they were lobbying to close the School of the Americas and to cut the funding. And they went to the office of a congressman from my home state of Wisconsin, and they talked about it. And at least in one cycle, he sat and listened to him and was, in fact, influenced enough to vote to cut the funding. And his name was Paul Ryan. <laughs> no, that, my point is that, that it is possible uh, to touch the heart of folks, even in this, in this most corrupted and most difficult of times. It's harder, but it's possible. So I really believe in that. And never, I, I hate the thing of going to visit, you know, those who you think you can influence. Go to visit those you don't think you have a chance to influence. You may be well surprised by that. Uh, I had a friend, one final note on this. I had a friend who was a farmer, and he's a member of a farm group, and he came in, and he said that his farm organization, this is why I don't like these organizations a lot, his farm organization told him, well, don't go to the Democrats and don't go to the progressives in, in here, and don't go to the city folk. They don't like you, and they don't understand you. They said this before they sent the farmers up. And this guy said, well, that doesn't seem to make much sense. I think I'm going to go only to the African-American members of the legislature. And he said an interesting thing. He went only to the African-American members of the legislature. He came back, and they're all sitting there, and they're saying, yeah, the other farmers, I met with an aide, or they let me drop something off on their desk. And this farmer said, yeah, I went in there, and my in my you know, case hat and stuff like that. And a couple of them I was right, invited right into the office and sat with the legislator for quite a while. And everybody wanted to know me better. And um, I've got these three people who said they're very interested in the stuff we're working on. He went counter to what his organization told him to do because these organizations too often are an extension of the corrupt power itself. And so go beyond, go further. And the final thing I'll tell you is if you want to know the power of the people, I'll tell you the power of the people. Donald Trump got elected president of the United States talking about a Muslim ban. And he and Bannon and Miller tried to implement it. And before the courts were there, people were at those airports on that Saturday night. And it was an amazing people power response. And if you don't think that courts can be influenced, as well as legislators, by people showing up in mass numbers and saying no to that which is wrong, then you're not doing effective politics. Because the fact of the matter is, this presidency is different because people have gone to airports and to town hall meetings and done all kinds of incredible grass work, grassroots work that has made the agenda of this president and this Congress much more difficult than it would have been. So people have an immense power. So we've gotten a signal that we have five minutes left. We have lots of questions here. And I'm going to ask the, the panel to wrap up with some suggestions for all of us on what makes the biggest impact. Michael talked about how important it is to go in and meet with your member, but we know realistically that's not something easy for folks to do to go to D.C. or even to go to Denver. And um, there have been some terrific examples of grassroots impact that's made a difference. One of our questioners has asked the question, do petitions matter, he says, or she says, I've spent hours signing them. I want to ask you to answer that question and also to give us and our group the best examples you've seen of grassroots activism that's made a difference. John gave us an example. I'm hoping you'll give us some others. Uh, petitions fall on that spectrum I referred to, I think on the end of something that could be easily manipulated and manufactured. And if there's a paid group that's p paid by signature, for example, I think that, that demeans um, the power of a petition. If it's a legitimate petition, that's great. Um, and I guess I, you know, when you join an organization and you've made a commitment to it, whether it's financial or some other way, that 
something that has a fingerprint on it that you really care about this and your, your, your voice is really part of this missive to the elected official, I think is more important um, than anything else. So I, I would just look to see how, I mean, California has all these, you know, referendums and things and these organizations as a cottage industry to collect signatures, some of which are legitimate, some of which are not. And it, I think it's, I would not pay as much attention to that. Um, examples of grassroots efforts that have succeeded, um, you know, I, I think you, ha you have to go back a ways probably because um, right now there's a lot of veto points in our in our system, the, the one that I watch in, in Washington. Um, but s some of the, um, like for example, when the, the 86 tax reform was an example of, of members just steamrolling every special interest uh, in the city for uh, a magical period of time, and there was a lot of, of ordinary voters who said, yeah, this is good, let's push behind this. And it was a bipartisan effort, it started in the Senate Finance Committee, and it took, uh, it took shape in ways that no one had expected. And I think something like that is, a, is an example. Yeah, I'd say in, in the Tip O'Neill vein, there's a ton of um, anti-competitive legislation at the state level. And at the state level, to join a trade group to go to the legislature to fight that sort of anti-competitive legislation, that is, for example, in Louisiana, there were two great victories for um, sort of homegrown funeral parlors and um, homegrown pine box burials and hair weavers, all of whom were set out by, they, they were shut out of the market by these incredible licensing requirements. You got to go to school, you know, telling African American women, you got to go to school for two years to learn how to weave hair. Get the hell out of Dodge. <laughs> But that was a way to protect the entrenched industries. And those trade groups got together and went to uh, Baton Rouge and got those laws thrown out. So little trade groups can be, uh, can be a big help on, on grassroots tyranny. All right. I like Baton Rouge, don't That's you? That's good, yeah, yeah. Well, I kind of like being against tyranny. <laughs> All right. 21 year, 20 years ago, if we had gathered in this room as the enlightened people of Boulder and its environs, and if I said to you, in short order, our lesbian and gay brothers and sisters would be able to marry, you would have said, ah, oh, that's very romantic, Mr. Nichols. I like your optimism. It's the thing that people always say when they, dis when they think you're nuts. Um, but the fact of the matter is that the LGBTQ community embarked on a journey not that long ago. Now, admittedly, you got roots back to Stonewall, but not that long ago. And they said, there are basic human rights here. You have a right to marry the person that you love. You have a right to be in that hospital room when your partner for 50 years is dying. You have a right to make sure that the children you have adopted will have equal protection. And they went into a society that was well organized to oppose them. And, that, and some of the biggest problems were Democrats who said, you know, I am with you. If, if, by the way, if anybody ever says they're with you, the, the, the word that follows that officially is but. Um, you know, and Democrats were terrible on this and Republicans were awful on it. And yet, and yet, they kept going back. And they kept saying, this is why we have to come out of the closet. This is why we have to be public. This is why we have to be seen. And in a very short amount of time in the arc of history, they took this nation from a place of incredible restriction to a place where even now when we have a Republican Congress and a Republican president who are not on board and there will be pushback and there are, there are structural challenges, that right to marry is generally accepted in this country. One at the ballot box, at the legislative level, in the courts, but most importantly, by grassroots activists. The most beautiful thing I've seen in the last five years, and I've seen a lot of beautiful stuff, the most beautiful thing I've seen in the last few years was standing on the steps in the courthouse in Madison, Wisconsin, when the county clerk figured out that there was a, a little window of opening in a, in a judicial ruling that was still in process, and that county clerk, Scott McDonald, said, well, for these next few hours, I am issuing marriage licenses. And hundreds and hundreds of couples, women in their 80s, men you know, who'd been together for 50 years, young people who'd just gotten together, came to those steps and they married. 
judges lined up out in front in their robes and said, I'll take you and we'll marry you inside here. There were people who were there with money, cash, saying, if you don't have the money to pay for your, your marriage license, I'll pay it. And some of my neighbor kids who were in the junior high school strings band went up because they said nobody should get married without some music. <laughs> it was one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen, and it was not done by any president. It wasn't done by any Congress. And even at the end, it was the judges following, not leading. The fact of the matter is, against all odds, we have more power than we could ever imagine. Our number one job is to use it, use it, use it, and make this a just and honorable nation. Thank you. Thanks to our panel. Thank you all so much for coming, for being here, and don't forget to follow up. Power to the people. Thank you so much. I'm all for unfettered political speech. Good view with you again, too. Good to be with both you guys. Good to be with you, too. I know it's easier to get the applause. 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 Applause.